Hello, Criminal Procedure team. Dr. C ringing in as we prepare for our next meeting this week here in week three. Now, I know we bounced around a little bit here and there, been kind of wrestling with some of the philosophical and the theoretical along with the black and white factual stuff, which we're getting to now. So I want to thank you for allowing me to kind of just poke around a bit to find out where everyone was at on, um, you know, on the reading itself and your comprehension and understanding and absorption of the material. So I can't make you memorize. Memorization would beget uh, multiple choice and true false. And there's nothing wrong with those, but I would prefer to talk about the mechanics of procedure, how things happen. And we'll take a, we'll do a review this week too as well, right from the beginning, looking at some of the key phrases, the terms, and the steps involved in, say, an arrest and what happens during that time, and what can go wrong. So we're going to come right back to the black and white issues, the black and white topics, all right? We've done, I think we've exhausted the philosophical and, and the social constructs, all those things right now, okay, which are important. But let's take a look here, all right? In Chapter 2, this is really critical, and a lot of these things here bring back memories, because not only in my undergrad years did we have to know this, but when we went to the academy, when you go to the academy, um, you will have these classes. You'll have a criminal law or a procedural class, because you have to pay close attention to some of these Supreme Court rulings, okay, and um, uh, the Supreme Court rulings that directly impact the decisions people make, quote, on the street. So we look at the exclusionary rule. What does that mean? Well, when you say exclusionary, you're pulling something out. It's not admissible, even though it was brought in, you know, in good faith. So there are certain court cases here that outlines that. The Weeks case, I recall, is one of the most important that we had to know because it is a tangible and direct representation of the, of say, daily, really almost day, we're talking about daily activities on behalf of the police looking to enforce the law and conduct lawful investigations, they need to go get the proverbial stuff, the evidence or evidence. So this one here was very, very important. Weeks was important. Elkins to an extent, but a bigger one that we had to memorize per se, and we had to really understand its application was MAP versus Ohio. The Supreme Court decided there, okay, that the rule also applied to the states that you could not bring in evidence that was unlawfully seized. All right. So in that case there, if I'm not mistaken, it was, you know, it was pertaining to some obscene materials. So she uh, initially claimed that it was a violation of the first, but the court swept that aside and said, no, this is a Fourth Amendment issue because you went out. You basically went in without a warrant. And we'll talk about warrants, too, as well. And what you what do you need to actually ask for and how do you articulate that when you're looking to honor the requirements of the Fourth Amendment? OK. So there's been debate here, naturally, concerning the applicability of the exclusionary rule. And this is how it works. You go, you, it, when they, a defendant is challenging the seizure evidence, you'll have, you know, have a, a suppression hearing, and that's usually at superior court. And all that, needs to be, all that needs to be established is probable cause, right? And you know that definition. You have to establish probable cause to show that the evidence was taken in good faith, okay, the information, the evidence, and the facts that supported, you know, a, a, an honorable uh, alignment with the requirements of the Fourth Amendment, okay? So you can read along here. These are important points that are in the book itself, okay? And there is criti naturally, there's always going to be criticism of that, you know, and there's a lot of, you see, the thing about the amorphous quality of this thing is that evidence seized on every single case, maybe the, the, the particulars are going to be different. There may be a lot of similarities, but it's the how, who, what, where, and why that matters most to the courts. You know, do, were you justified? Who gave you the information? Does your evidence support it? Did you, did you bring in enough facts and circumstances that would lead a reasonable person to believe that a crime has been or is about to be committed? There's also emergencies or exigent circumstances that may forego, you know, the app, uh, warrant, uh, an affidavit and warrant application, all right? So anyway, since MAP, as you can see right here, these are very good decisions because, you know, when you're, when you're putting a case together, you don't want to lose the case. You're working on behalf of a victim or victims. But, the, you know, these, case, these cases keep you, these, these decisions keep us honest, right? So since MAP and other significant decisions, and you know how it says here, innocent people have been subjected to fewer unconstitutional searches, not only because the police, uh, they, we fear, you know, the loss of the evidence itself, but because of potential liability. You're violating someone's civil rights and you could be sued. Okay, so 
When does it not apply? Make sure you read through that. These are important points. This is chapter two. All right. There's good faith exception. We can talk about that. Some of these things we kind of glanced over. One big one here is, and you've heard of this, I'm sure, the fruit of the poisonous tree. So whatever starts out wrong can never be made right. So if you see something wrong, even in good faith or whatever it may be, if it was wrong and there was not enough probable cause established, then the forbidden fruit must be excluded. Okay? Exceptions. Read through that. All right, I'm not going to read every little line here, here, but make sure you understand, are there exceptions to the fruit of the poisonous tree? And there are. It's not a pure science. It really isn't. And naturally, there are civil remedies for violating, someone, oops, violating someone's rights. Very, very important to understand that, okay? Liability of state officials, the color of law, okay? Make sure you read through that. And over here, this is something that scares every police officer in the world because you always have to make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed in a metaphorical sense. The second requirement for a successful Section 1983, if you're sued under this particular statute, okay, it what it, it does is it's basically seeking to establish that you, the police officer, violated someone's civil rights, their constitutional rights, okay? And the words and the language is pretty clear. So make sure you read through that. There's a immune, qualified immunity. There's a lot of debate going on about that. All right, very very important that officers, you know, may be immune unless they're they've done something completely off the rails, egregious. But they may be immune even if they did violate someone's constitutional rights. So you make sure you read through that. Okay. All right. So we'll and sorry for the interruption here, but now we're going to move into the real. The, the blood and guts of this course, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. And this will help develop, you know, uh, assessments. In other words, what we put together as a real strong, healthy, um, not a test, but some sort of project. I would like to discuss that with everybody here. But now the big one, the Fourth Amendment. We'll be talking about this. We'll be pulling this apart with our very own teeth so you really have a great understanding and comprehension of the Fourth Amendment. Okay? Very, very important. So make sure you start reading into this if you haven't already. Make sure you understand these terms. We will review these. I know it can be dry, but let me tell you, gang, this is really important stuff. Okay? As you can see, there's an act, this is a murder case that occurred in, in uh, New Hampshire where he killed a child. And so a lot of things do hit home. We are not immune to this. So make sure that you read into Chapter 3. I expect everyone to really try to gra get, you know, get a strong grasp on the cases. And again, thank you for allowing us to diverge a little bit to digress and talk about the philosophical and theoretical aspects of the law. Now we're into the nitty-gritty. We're going to be talking about case law, and you're going to need to know some of these cases. Why? Not the world according to me, but these are case decisions that affect everyone's life, everyone's daily activities, okay? So I will post up the PowerPoint, so but get ready to get right down into the nitty-gritty. Thanks for great discussions this week, and we'll see you tomorrow.